Welcome back to Multidimensional Models of Abnormal Behavior, Part 2, The Neurobiology of Human Behavior. There are a few important generalities to know about the neurobiology of the brain. For one, the purpose of genes is to code for proteins, and the genes that impact psychopathology are likely coding for proteins operating in the brain. Two, there are four lobes of the brain, and of the four lobes, the frontal lobe is the most important for psychopathology. In fact, those with damage to the frontal lobe are more likely to have difficulties with attention, distractibility, memory problems, as well as pseudo-antisocial behaviors and aggression. Neurotransmitters are chemicals in the brain that transmit electrical messages. They allow brain regions to talk to one another and to carry out a variety of functions. And although we don't have an exact causal relationship, there is mounting evidence that neurotransmitters play in a significant role in the various abnormal behaviors that we'll talk about throughout this class. So first, let's talk a little bit about how neurons communicate and the role of neurotransmitters, and then we'll come back and talk about potential problems with this process. In the brain, we have neurons, and they talk to one another by sending out neurotransmitters that are then interpreted by the next neuron. As we can see here, each neuron has a cell body, a nucleus, and a single axon. When messages are sent from one neuron, they're then picked up by the dendrites of the next neuron. They're then processed and sent onto the axon, and that message follows down the myelin sheath and jumps across the nodes and then flows out of the axon terminals and to the dendrites of the next neuron. Think of the dendrites as little hands that are picking up information and knowledge. The nerve cell processes it, then it moves the info on to the next little neuron. Here we'll see how it is that the neurons communicate. And there are two neurons and then a space in between that's referred to as the synapse. The axon terminal on the top is the presynaptic axon terminal and it is releasing a neurotransmitter into the receptor sites of the postsynaptic dendrites of the next neuron. The receptor sites are very, very smart, and they only accept the message if the key fits, meaning that the postsynaptic dendrites are designed to accept a certain neurotransmitter and only a certain amount of that neurotransmitter. This helps regulate the amount that is passed on from one neuron to the next. But there are several things that could go wrong with this process. For example, the first neuron might be releasing too much of the neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter is broken down and reabsorbed by that axon terminal when this happens. This is called reuptake. But what if that neuron doesn't know that it's supposed to pull some of that neurotransmitter back? This will lead to chemical imbalances because it's leaving too much there in the synaptic space. Many of our drugs are now designed to trick the postsynaptic dendrite into taking it. So thinking the drug is actually the neurotransmitter. When this happens, it's blocking that site from receiving more of the neurotransmitter, and that way more is left in the synaptic space so that it can be used. These are called antagonist drugs, and we'll talk a little bit more about those in a few minutes. Go back to our discussion on the diathesis stress model and think about how this system might be vulnerable. An example would be an individual has a predisposition to making too little of a particular neurotransmitter. They function fine and they're doing well, and there'd be no reason to even know that they had this predisposition until they encounter a stressor event. Once they encounter the stressor event, the fact that they had improper neurochemicals now contributes to developing PTSD. And without having encountered that stressor, we would never have known that there was a vulnerability already in place with the neurotransmitters. Both of them together are the reason why they've developed PTSD. There are many different neurotransmitters that are involved in psychopathology, and we're gonna only talk about a handful of them today. Serotonin influences the processing of information, aggressiveness, eating, even sexual behavior. It's involved with anxiety, eating disorders, insomnia, perhaps is best known for its role in depression. At low levels, we see increased impulsivity, reactivity, and decreased inhibition. And according to the latest hypothesis, depression is caused by a low level of serotonin in specific parts of the brain. Prozac 
is one in a family of drugs that we call SSRIs, and this stands for Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors. And it's perhaps the most popular drug for treating depression, anorexia, obsessive compulsive disorder, and a whole body of different concerns. Prozac works by preventing the reuptake of serotonin into the presynaptic axon terminals. And we think this happens because it's binding to receptors in that presynaptic cell and that blocks the reuptake of the neurotransmitter. Remember, receptor sites will only accept something if it fits, which implies that Prozac is the right shape to fit the serotonin receptors. By inhibiting the reuptake process, Prozac enhances the action of serotonin by leaving more of it available in the synapse, meaning it's also available for the brain to use. Our second neurotransmitter is GABA. GABA inhibits emotions and behavior and reduces anxiety. And it does this because the GABA receptors decrease action potentials generated by neurons in the amygdala. As a result, the activity of the amygdala as a whole is decreased and fewer neurons are sending signals from the amygdala to other parts of the brain, which in turn leads to a reduction in the physiological and the psychological markers of stress and anxiety. Benzodiazepines regulate the GABA system, and that's why they're often used to treat anxiety. Dopamine is a switch that inhibits or facilitates emotions and behavior. It can balance serotonin levels. Deficits in dopamine are associated with Parkinson's disease. Excesses in dopamine are found in schizophrenia. It can create lethargy, decreased goal-driven behavior, and cognitive deficits. There's a theory that schizophrenia is related to an excess of dopamine because of the negative symptoms that we see, the lethargy and decreased goal-driven behavior, as well as the cognitive deficits that we see with schizophrenia. Antipsychotic drugs are thought to alleviate the symptoms of schizophrenia by blocking the action of dopamine. However, we know it must be a little bit more complicated than just that because dopamine antagonists, those medicines that reduce dopamine, help with the psychotic symptoms, but they do not impact the negative symptoms. So we think dopamine may only be involved with some of those symptoms of schizophrenia. The last neurotransmitter that we'll talk about today is norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is interesting because it acts as a neurotransmitter and as a hormone. Excesses and deficits in norepinephrine are involved in mood disorders and eating disorders. I'm often asked, how can dopamine have both excitability and lethargy? How does the same neurotransmitter have opposite effects on people's behavior? Different parts of the brain use dopamine and are sensitive to dopamine. An excess or a deficit in dopamine that is occurring in different parts of the brain can have different effects and manifest differently. This is why we might see both excitability or lethargy if there's an excess of dopamine. Neurotransmitters also impact one another. Dopamine may affect the functioning of another neurotransmitter, which would then change the manifestation of the underlying problem, meaning we might be masking that the real problem relates to the available amounts of dopamine or that dopamine's been shut off. Also, the excess dopamine can affect the membrane of another cell, the receptor site, and then inhibit that cell's functioning. As a result, the actions of that cell are impaired and we would see problems related to what that cell was supposed to be doing. Remember, this excess or deficit itself can occur for a variety of reasons. There may be releasing improper amounts at the presynaptic neuron, but it may also be that the receptor site is more or less so sensitive to dopamine, so it's soaking up too much or too little. It may even be responding to an excess or deficit of another neurotransmitter, such as serotonin. Given the variety of things that could go wrong in this process, different medications help these processes in different ways. Agonist drugs activate the receptor neuron so that it can produce the desired response. This increases the action of the neurotransmitter. For example, dopamine agonists bind to dopamine receptors, meaning they're mimicking dopamine, and that will directly stimulate the receptors. Antagonist drugs block the receptor neuron from being activated. This will reduce the neurotransmitter's action. Again, dopamine antagonists bind to, but don't stimulate dopamine receptors. This prevents or reverses the actions of dopamine by keeping dopamine from attaching to the receptor sites. Reuptake inhibitors such as Prozac, 
and other SSRIs increased the action of the neurotransmitter by decreasing the presynaptic neuron's ability to reabsorb it in order to destroy or use it. As a result, it's leaving more available for use.